Recently, there was a book published that talked about the oldest book historians know to exist in this world. It was a book written by a sage giving advice to a young pharaoh thousands of years ago. And it's interesting what's widely quoted from that ancient book. It's this simple statement, Pharaoh, nobody is born wise. Nobody is born wise. That means that every single one of us in this church this morning, as we have lived our lives, look back and say, you know, we've done some foolish things. We've said some foolish things. We've done things we can't undo. But as we experience life and reflect upon it, we grow in wisdom. And that's a very important part of accepting ourselves, not persecuting ourselves for the mistake we made, but praising God that we have grown in wisdom as we have lived our lives. So Jesus, in today's gospel, it says he exclaimed, he just didn't say thank you, Father. He exclaimed, Father, thank you so much. You have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to the little ones. What is he saying? What does that mean? How does it relate to our lives? Certainly, he was not against being educated and the church values the life of the mind. But what he was saying is that if people consider themselves wise and learned and kind of look down on the sweating masses of humanity, that's repulsive in the eyes of God. It's a very important kind of teaching. And you know, it always has relevance. I like to listen to uh, educational programs about physics. Not that I understand physics, but neither do the physicists, because there is no overarching theory that explains all of their observations. The Nobel Prize winner said, nobody understands quantum mechanics. Okay, so I'm listening to this fellow who was born Catholic, went to Catholic universities, became a theoretical physicist, and he says, this is such a mistake. Do you realize they did a study of the top scientists in the world and 7% of them value their spiritual life? Why would that many scientists be valuing a spiritual life? It doesn't make any sense. It's kind of an embarrassment. So that's the kind of uh, attitude that Jesus is saying, oh, you, you haven't revealed the mysteries of life to those who are puffed up and taken, taken over by their own insights. Now, Jesus says this, you have revealed them to the little ones. Jesus is not talking about people's height. He is talking about the spiritual quality of their souls. What does he mean? Well, Jesus had sophisticated followers, not just humble fishermen from Galilee. Matthew, the tax collector, Zacchaeus, the tax collector, they, they were wealthy people. Nicodemus, the Pharisee, Joseph Arimathea, the Pharisee, they were well-educated. And Susanna, the wife of Herod Stuart, a wealthy position to be in. But their sophistication did not destroy their spiritual life for two reasons, two virtues I really want to hold up to you as being very important keys to living a spiritual life. The first is humility. Jesus says, I am meek and humble of heart. And Zachariah says, boy, rejoice. When our Savior comes, he Zechariah gave an alternative vision. The vision the Jewish people had was the Romans are going to be destroyed, they're going to be conquerors, 
our king is going to restore Israel to its proper place. He's going to come in marching with an army, the blood of the defeated Romans running on the street. And Zacchaeus said, no, no. Your king will come riding on a donkey, a humble king to whom you do not have to bow, a king who is your brother and your Lord. It's an alternative vision to the Messiah, and that's the vision that Jesus embraced. So that's why he says, come to me to be humble. What does being humble mean? It means deflating our egos, not thinking of ourselves as the center of the universe, not judging everything by its effect upon us, walking the common earth where everyone is a brother or a sister. And that's an important one. And then the second virtue we don't talk about as much is simplicity. It is characteristic of holy persons that no matter how educated they are, no matter how sophisticated, no matter how complex is their expertise, underneath that there is a simplicity that allows them to be unimpressed by the wealth and the power and the privilege of this world. It is a beautiful quality that allows people to see through to the essence of things, letting go of the need to control everything, an openness to the guidance of the Spirit. And that's what Paul said in the second reading. If you have the Spirit of the Lord within you, what a gift, what a gift that is. And so he says, you know, carry your burdens. In, in the previous reading last week, carry the cross. Everybody does have a certain amount of cross in life, a certain amount of burden, it's kind of inescapable. But persons who are both humble and have the gift of fundamental simplicity can do something extraordinary that I've experienced. That is, they can take the pain of their life and make it a source of healing for others. I haven't read that in the book. I've experienced that in my ministry. I'll never forget the most important, the most significant parish council meeting I was ever at. The meetings were open to parishioners. We were just sitting around talking normal stuff. And in walks a parishioner. And she stands up before the whole pastoral council and says, my husband and I have been members of this church since it was founded by Monsignor Coyne. We have been in the choir all of that time. We have sent our children to this school. This church has been very important to us, but now my children are grown up and gone, my husband has died, and there is nothing for me in this parish. What are we going to do about it? I had such admiration for this person who could just be so upfront about her need. We've become friends from that moment on. Well, I didn't know how to respond. So, being a cook, I said, well, I'll invite the widows to lunch at the rectory. And that's what I did. And it was, it was, it was eye-opening for me as they talked about their houses, once filled with the laughter of children, the love of their husband, now as empty as a morgue and quiet. And there they were rattling around alone, and it was an immensely painful experience. So I always ended being depressed. However, it really reached people. The last time my mother and I attended a, a luncheon of the widows, there were 37 widows there because the word spread. But then we realized, you know, it's not only in our parish that we have widows. There are other parishes 
There are Protestant congregations. There are Jewish synagogues. There are Muslim mosques where there are widows having the same pain because it's part of the human condition. And so what we did was we started a program of training people in various worship communities to work with the sick, the terminally ill, and the bereaved. It was called the Interfaith Training Network. And over the years, we trained 800 persons in various worship communities to reach out with an understanding and a compassion for those who were grieving, those who were sick, those who were bereaved. It was a beautiful experience. And we, and we were meeting because we had a board that kind of ran things. And this member of the board stood up at the end of a meeting. She was the treasurer of the Prince George's County Hospice. And she said this, do you people realize what's happening in this work we're doing? And nobody knew what she was talking about. And then she said this, when we need a lawyer, along comes a lawyer. When we need an accountant, along comes an accountant. When we need a place to meet, the Cancer Society opens the door. When we, we, when we need some funds, somebody makes a donation. It's like wherever we go, a door opens for us. She had the, the simplicity of heart to understand God's working in this world and in this ministry. She had the eyes to see it. And I'll never forget her standing up and doing that. And that is exactly what Jesus has said. You know, ask you shall receive, seek you will find, knock the doors will be open for you. But to actually experience that happening because we're doing God's will, that is a wonderful revelation in our lives. And so, I recommend to you the virtues of humility, first of all, which makes it also impossible for us, possible for us to have the gift of simplicity, to see through the complexity of life to what is going on deep in the human condition. That's the gift of simplicity. And it means we can turn away from our Earth's aggressive, aggressive pursuit of money, wealth, and power. And we, we can find more noble values by which to live our lives, especially the gift of being compassionate because we are aware of the suffering and the needs of others. One of the most beautiful hymns in our country besides Amazing Grace, is the Shaker hymn. The gift, tis a gift to be simple. It's a beautiful hymn. And it's filled with faith. And uh, guess what? Grace is going to sing it for you now, accompanied by her handsome husband on the piano. Just listen to this. We're not born with wisdom. They were right thousands of years ago in Egypt but through humility and simplicity, we will grow in wisdom. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.